wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. The Chris Voss Show. Dot com. Hey, we appreciate you guys tuning in, being part of the show. The show, as it were, another podcast. Wow. Uh, do you know, we, we just sit around some days and we're like, it's another day. Should we do another podcast? And we're like, yeah, let's do one. And then we have these brilliant minds that show up. These great authors, they write the, they write the most brilliant books. They write, uh, you know, from some of the greatest newspapers out there and, uh, and they show up and they show and they give us all this knowledge and we're smarter because of it. So what you should do, if you're really, really smart, now this is for the smart people out there. You want to take and refer your family's relatives and everybody go to the cvpn.com or Chris Voss podcast network.com subscribe to all nine podcasts. You can take and do that. It's free too for an, unlimited time it'll be free so you want to rush over and grab that while it's still available uh the other thing you can do is you can watch the video versions of all these wonderful conversations we're having on youtube.com for just chris voss hit that bell notification button you can also uh, follow me on goodreads.com for slash chris voss we're trying to build out a nice little book club there if we can and everything else so that should be good uh today we have a most exceptional brilliant author on she is the author of the book unholy unholy <laughs> that didn't come out quite as well, much as i practiced it unholy why white evangelicals worship at the altar of donald trump by sarah posner and sarah is with us today she's got an incredible bio here she's a reporting fellow with type investigations her investigative Reporting has appeared in Rolling Stone, Vice, The Nation, Mother Jones, The New Republic, HuffPost, and Talking Points Memo. Her coverage in the analysis of politics and religion has appeared in the New York Times, The Washington Post, The American Prospect, Politico, and many other outlets. She graduated from Wesleyan University. I'm not sure if I got that right, but she'll correct me if I'm wrong. And has a law degree from the University of Virginia. Her story, How Trump Took Eight Groups Mainstream, published before the 2016 election, won a Sydney Hillman Foundation Award. Welcome to the show. How are you, Sarah? Thanks for having me, Chris. Awesome. So, did I get that right on the Wesleyan University? Yep. I went to Trump University and Betsy DeVos Public School, so I'm not good at <laughs> spelling and all that stuff. So you wrote this book, Unholy. That, that's what I was looking for right there. Uh -huh. There it is. It's like the Gene Simmons kiss, Unholy. Uh, so you wrote this wonderful book, this brilliant insight. Um, give us your plugs on where people can find you on the interwebs and learn more about you in the book. So they can find me at the Type Investigations website, typeinvestigations.org, or my own personal website, sarahposner.com. Uh, they can follow me on Twitter. Uh, my handle is just at Sarah Posner, uh, just one word, and uh, no underscores or anything. And uh, yeah, and so that's where they can uh, find um, my recent writing, my recent thoughts on, especially on Twitter, my recent thoughts on this, that, and the other thing. There you go. You write for a lot of great papers and, and uh, news outlets, I guess. They don't say papers anymore, do they? Mm. You can tell how old I am, right? Right, right. <laughs> So uh, what motivated you to write this book? Well, I've been covering the religious right for a long time and the intersection of religion and politics. And during the 2016 uh, campaign, I covered the Republican primary and in particular, who out of that field of 17 candidates was the religious right going to get behind? And at the same time, I was also covering why or how these openly white supremacist neo-Nazi groups of the alt-right were backing Trump. And so that all kind of came together when he got the nomination and all of those groups got behind his candidacy in the general election campaign. And the book grew out of um, some of the reporting that I had done over the course of the campaign, but also 
uh, reporting that I had done during the first uh, two years of his uh, presidency. Yeah. And so give us an overview of the book. Uh, what What's the, the broad scope of it? So the, the big through line or takeaway from the book is that the Christian right and the alt-right came together to support Trump because of their shared hostility to civil rights. And um, there's obviously like a lot more to the book than that, but those are the, the that is the, the draw for both of those groups. Trump is a strong man. Trump is uh, opposed to ver- various elements of our democracy, both our democratic values like civil rights and human rights and our democratic institutions like an independent judiciary or a free press. Um, And these are features, not bugs. They don't support him in spite of his his, uh, foibles on these fronts. These are the things that they actually like about him. Do you see any changes in in as we go into the electorate, uh, you know, the the election here, geez, we're down to two weeks. Can you believe Mm -hmm. it? It's crazy. Uh, Do you see any changes where they're going to give up? uh, They're like, well, maybe this is a bad choice. We should probably move on. (laughs) Uh, Not not among white evangelicals. Um, The interesting I think the interesting demographic uh, in terms of watching how they're going to go in the election are white Catholics. Mm. Right. So when we talk about the religious right, we're talking about a coalition of white evangelicals, white Catholics and white mainline Protestants. Now, white evangelicals, they are the ones who, 81% of them voted for Donald Trump in 2016. I was looking at a poll this morning um, showing a dead heat in North Carolina uh, between Trump and Biden, Um, but 82% of white evangelicals are still gonna vote for Trump in in North Carolina. Uh, So I think we've seen a little bit more movement um, among white Catholics. Uh, we haven't seen a ton of movement from white evangelicals. They're very dedicated to the idea that Donald Trump is uh, a savior of, of sorts, come uh, anointed by God to come save what they perceive as a Christian, a white Christian America uh, at a very uh, critical juncture in its history. So to them, all of the things that he does, the fake news, the conspiracy theories, the ramming through the judicial nominees, all of these things are positives. These are not negatives for his base. Wow. So did you see yesterday, I guess he was in my my home city, Las Vegas. Uh, he actually fronted a hundred bucks into a, a collection plate. I was kind of surprised he did that because he's so cheap. Oh, on Sunday. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I was like, somebody got money that did. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you probably took it out of the campaign stash. So let's get into the book. Uh, what were some of the things that you found as you as you wrote the book and you did your research? Well, initially, so so since since the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980, we have seen a very uh, disciplined and consolidated religious right that has gotten behind the Republican nominee for president. But before that, they play a very important role in the primaries in terms of vetting the primary, the Republican primary uh, candidates for their um, for their uh, loyalty to a bunch of different lit- litmus tests. Um, obviously, opposition to uh, legal abortion, um, opposition to uh, same-sex marriage or LGBTQ rights are really big things. But another element of that is the candidates have to be able to tell their story, their salvation story, their story of how they came to Jesus, their story of what their Christian faith means um, in, uh, in terms of policy and governance and how it affects the way they um, see their role as a politician. Um, so of course, Donald Trump ticked off zero of those boxes, right? Right. So like he's, you know, he obviously has that, a, yeah. And, and especially the, the box about being able to talk about his faith. I mean, he, not only could he not coherently talk about his faith, um, but he also couldn't cite Bible verses. He couldn't, you know, um, <laughs> second Corinthians, all of that. So, um, Corinthians, yeah. so what you saw 
during the primary campaign was notwithstanding the reluctance of a lot of the religious right leadership, not all of it, but big chunks of it to get behind Trump. A lot of them backed other candidates like Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio. Mm -hmm. But what you saw was the base was very enamored of him. And I think that that is in large part because he speaks to a lot of cultural touchstones for them that may not be explicitly Christian, but tie in or biblical, but tie in with the way um, the prosperity gospel culture has changed American evangelicalism. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that he could talk about his wealth or his perceived wealth or his supposed wealth um, and talk about himself in these kind of superhuman terms. Like when you uh, see him talk about how he overcame coronavirus, for example, um, that is very much a sort of prosperity gospel way of talking about it mm -hmm. because uh, only the true believers and the faithful um, have riches and great wealth uh, and health bestowed upon them by God. That's why it's sometimes called the health and wealth gospel. Interesting um, prosperity. So I think the base was, was, was sidling up to him before the leadership was. And I think a lot of the stuff that other people were appalled by the nativism, the racism, the anti-immigrant um, diatribes, you know, early in his primary campaign. These again were positives for a lot of white evangelicals who felt like previous uh, Republicans had been too soft on immigration, had been too cowed by political correctness. Um, and so eventually uh, the leadership caught up with the, the base and now the leadership too uh, is, is on board with the idea that, that Donald Trump is was chosen by God or God's hand is on him and he's leading America at this critical juncture in its history. How much of the base believes that because their leaders told them that as opposed to they just bought it? like About him being anointed? Yeah, anointed by God. Yeah. Well, I Did think... Did that just come like, like they're just like, yeah, we kind of think he is or was there think, enough preachers pushing it? I think there were enough preachers push, pushing it, but I mm -hmm. also think that it's so common, um, particularly in Pentecostal and charismatic communities, to believe that God ordained certain people for certain roles in politics or society, that it was sort of ripe for that kind of organic growth, the organic growth of that kind of belief in the base. But there were certainly leaders who were pushing it early on. I give you that uh, he probably is an angel, but at this point it's an angel of death, economic destruction and, and sickness. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. exactly. But no, that's interesting. The prosperity thing. I never really, I never really put that together. We had the uh, senior editor, Dan Alexander on yesterday and we we're talking about the Forbes list and the mm -hmm. Forbes file and stuff mm -hmm. on him. And, and uh, you know, the whole, <laughs> is he really worth what he says he is? Et cetera, right, et right. And, but, but it's interesting, you know, the braggadocio, like you mentioned of, of him being ah, I'm worth billions and talking about money. Uh, and, and on, over the show, we've, we've had, we've talked about how, you know, the differences about how there's the, the white churches and then there's the African-American community churches and how they were separated years ago by the civil war and racism and, and civil rights, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and does your book get into talking about why that that separation is there or what black communities think as opposed to white evangelicals? My book really focuses on um, the American right and particularly the religious right. So and basically the problem. The, the historic uh, political activity that led us to this mm -hmm. moment with Trump. So one of the one of the chapters of the book looks at the origins of the modern religious right. You know, when we're talking about them, obviously there's always been sort of a right wing evangelicalism uh, and right wing Catholicism in the United States. But when I'm talking about the religious right, it's the movement that came together in the moral majority in 1979 and supported um, Ronald Reagan's election in 1980 and has basically been um, hinged to the Republican Party ever since um, that this became an organized political movement, not because of abortion and the Supreme Court's decision in Roe v. Wade in 1973, but because of school desegregation and rules that um, the IRS put in place on uh, private, you know, 
private schools that were 501c3s that were uh, tax exempt organizations, um, putting their tax exemption at risk if they did not comply with certain rules intended to desegregate schools. Um, the religious right coalesced around this, around the idea that the government was imposing these rules, what they would, what they called at the time quotas, which they weren't, they weren't quotas, um, uh, as as an infringement on their religious freedom. And so you see the roots of a lot of our current uh, political and legal battles in that uh, sequence of events where um, they see the government as the enemy of their religious freedom by the government requiring them to comply with civil rights laws and rules that the rest of America has agreed um, are the kind of rules that we wanna live by um, in a democratic pluralistic society. So for example, the idea that after same-sex marriage, the government might come after uh, organizations that oppose same-sex marriage or the idea that it's, it's um, a violation of the cake baker's religious freedom to make him bake a cake for a same-sex couple or for a gay wedding. Speaking to that uh, point, it you know I've we've we've had a lot of discussions about the abortion issue and how it's you know it's just it's that hot button that Betsy DeVos's organization, the Council of whatever I forget, uh, National Policy, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 how how they use it as a hot button to get stuff done, but do. You, are they more concerned about what's going on with gay marriage and gay people? I mean, I, I you, you talk a little bit about how they're really concerned about how, you know, they at one point, um, the attorney general, they were trying to get stuff passed where they could make it so that you could discriminate against uh, having gay people in services of business, whether you're accountant, et cetera, et cetera. Is that a bigger right. issue than abortion for them? Or um, I think that they're equal. I mean, obviously they the religious right has been working to overturn legal abortion for many, many, many years. They're about to get that. They probably have already without Amy Coney Barrett, five votes potentially, but now like they've got, the, if they can get Amy Coney Barrett confirmed to the Supreme court, they're basically going to be in a position for Roe v. Wade to be overturned. We have like no doubt about that. Um, but you have to remember what they did before they embarked on this multi-decade effort to stack the court with justices who would be opposed to Roe, that over time, they chipped away at Roe. They made it harder to get an abortion. They you know, imposed these rules or these, you know, passed these laws that would um, impose restrictions on, on who could get an abortion or where you could get an abortion or at what phase in your pregnancy you could get an abortion. A similar thing is happening after the Supreme Court's decision in 2015 in Obergefell v. Hodges, which was the, the ruling that legalized same-sex marriage. That is another row for them, right? So they would love to eventually overturn that decision, but in the meantime, let's chip away at it. So maybe a gay couple can get married, but it would violate the religious freedom of a florist, in their view, um, for the couple to be able to go to the florist and say, can you do the flowers for our wedding? Um, and that would be required under many state and municipalities non-discrimination laws that prohibit discrimination in public accommodations. Uh, um, but this is the sort of thing that they're trying to chip away at, chip away at like, oh, can, um, you know, can an accountant say no to doing the taxes of a of a of a gay couple because they oppose same sex marriage on religious grounds? So these are the sorts of things that we're going to see. Another uh, dis, uh, case that the Supreme Court is going to hear this term is whether it violates the religious freedom of a foster care and adoption placement agency, you know, run by Catholic Social Services for the city of Philadelphia to say, well, to get a contract with us to place foster kids, you have to agree to abide by our non-discrimination law in Philadelphia, which prohibits discrimination against people based on sexual orientation or gender identity. And so because Catholic Social Services won't place children with same-sex couples, this is the legal dispute now. So all of these things obviously relate to marriage, right? So you chip away at what being able to get married means if you can't adopt children or you can't just go to any store and get the flowers or the cake or the accountant that you want. 
just astounding to me. Uh, we don't want to have abortions, so you'll have children you don't want, so you have to put them in adoption clinics, but then we won't let gay people adopt them, so the, they'll probably just suffer in, in some sort of, uh, you know, adoption uh, thing. Uh, what's the what's that old movie, the um, Oliver? <laughs> you know, you're going to suffer yeah. that way. Um, what's interesting to me, we're, uh, jumping back, we were talking about uh, desegregation and segregation. I didn't know until recently with some of the discussions we've had with authors that the voucher programs is actually a racist idea mm -hmm. and a concept that they came up with after, I think, the desegregation of the South or mm -hmm. the Civil War or mm -hmm. the Civil Rights era, where they're yeah. like, hey, we don't want our kids going to school with black people. And they came up with a voucher program. That's right. the that's the core of what that I, I didn't even know that. Well, a lot of a lot of these um, disputes, um, like like I said, you know, the dispute of whether the can the federal government make private um, tax exempt schools comply with these laws and, you know, to raise it as an issue of religious freedom. Um, a lot of these things are just sort of covers <laughs> for just opposing school desegregation and vouchers was a sort of similar thing. Yeah. The, the PR thing or the PC thing was really interesting too. Like the one thing I started seeing in 2015 was uh, all the people who supported Trump going, yeah, PC is bad. I mean, I still see it to this day. I'm like, geez, man, I mean, maybe you're a closet racist, but can you at least be decent to people around their face? And they're just so joyous. Um, how much do you really feel this is a blowback from having them having to be under the load of Obama for eight years? Oh, my God, what a horrible thing that was. Yeah, for. I mean, right. So I think that what you see over the course of our history, right, or in terms of civil rights, uh, you know, are steps forward and blow back and steps back, um, you know, nothing, you know, the moral arc of the universe, you know, is long, but it bends towards justice as, as um, the old saying. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I do think that, um, you know, the religious right grew out of this uh, hostility towards school desegregation back in the 1970s and 80s. Um, and the sort of Trump era of the religious right um, grew in part, um, you know, not completely like there are other factors too, but definitely grew in part out of having um, Obama be president for um, for eight years. You know, Trump uh, was the birther in chief, right? You know, he was the one running around looking for Obama's birth certificate and, and uh, you know, raising these questions about whether he was a, you know, a real American and all of that. And so he was the and he was the candidate that the base chose, right? So like yeah. they didn't choose to go the route of let's have a bigger tent um, and make the Republican party a bigger tent. They chose, the base chose the route of let's have a smaller, more racist tent. I, I never really thought of it, but yeah, you're right. They basically said, you know, hey, we don't want to school with blacks and we don't want to go to church with blacks and and uh, let's just make our own, you know, party. I remember I remember the uh, gentleman's name. I just was watching him on MSNBC this morning. Uh, he's done an ad uh, as a Republican. He was running the uh, GOP. Oh, uh, Michael Steele. Michael Steele. Great guy. Uh, he was running the Republican convention. And and back when Obama won, you know, he sat down with the Republicans and they kind of had this uh, come to Jesus moment, if you will. Right. Spare the irony. An autopsy. Um, <laughs> there you go. And they call and it they, an autopsy, right? Yeah. And he's like, you know, hey man, we need to build a bigger tent here. And uh wow, that that went out the window fast. <laughs> yes, and that's exactly what I'm saying. So, like they they did that autopsy, and the autopsy recommended uh building this bigger tent, more outreach to uh minority voters, making the party more diverse and less just focused on anti-immigrant whites. And, um, and, you know, this is clearly not with the direction that the base chose in, in 2016. And, uh, you know, Trump hasn't seen a real erosion of his support in the base, um, but obviously it's not really a message that has enabled him to really grow that base very much. So uh, you talked about how, uh, you know, one of the things that were important to them was getting around these IRS rules. I know there was a really prominent, uh, I think, preacher or preacher school guy, and the IRS kind of went a little heavy after him. Yep. 
And that really Bob Jones caused University. a lot of, right. yeah. Right. And so, so Bob Jones University was um, a, one of the early um, Christian universities to have its tax exemption revoked by the IRS because it had a policy banning interracial dating on campus. Wow. And they got it for a long time. Uh, and, and so you still hear uh, activists in the religious right talk about that case, right? They'll talk about, wow. well, remember Bob Jones, right? So like, this is why we need to see the government as being at odds with our religious freedom because the government took away Bob Jones University's uh, re uh, tax exemption, even though Bob Jones University claimed that the reason why they banned interracial dating was because they found it in the Bible. Yeah. And I believe Obama, I, I don't know if Obama's hand was in this, but I know during his administration, the IRS was kind of telling churches, hey, you got to clean up your act. You can't, you got to either pick a, a team, you can't be politics and, and, and uh, the thing. Am I correct on that? So um, there's, there's a part of the Internal Revenue call, Code called the Johnson Amendment. And it basically says if you have tax exempt status, like most churches and houses of worship do, um, you can't use the, these tax exempt resources to campaign for a candidate, right? Because, you know, you don't get a tax exemption when you make a donation to a political campaign. So by the same logic, you can't use a tax exempt donation to turn around and, and campaign for a, a candidate or against a candidate. Um, and it actually hasn't really been enforced that much. There've only been like maybe one um, or two uh, churches that had their tax exemption yanked uh, over that. Uh, but the religious right has made it another one of these, the government is against us and our religious freedom sort of issues. And so Trump early in his administration, first he promised that he would get rid of the Johnson Amendment, which he couldn't unilaterally do that. because it's part of a law. And so Congress would have to repeal it for it to be uh, undone, but he issued an executive order directing the IRS not to enforce it. Um, and so you've seen then now um, much more uh, overt campaigning for Trump at churches or by uh, church figures. Yeah. Um, and, you know, his his spiritual advisor, his personal pastor, Paula White, uh, who's a televangelist, you know, there's you don't really see much of a daylight between her role as a preacher televangelist and the role she plays being Trump's personal pastor and the role she plays as an official advisor uh, to the White House um, uh, faith-based initiative. So uh, yeah, there's been a lot of blurring of the lines under Trump. So with them in their, in the schools that they want to take and do, I know the Bessie DeVos this is a big hard on for her. Um, but is it, is it that they just don't want to be mixed with gays and black people and they don't want their kids being raised with them or interacting or dating with them? Or is it, is it more about just, uh, keeping them from the sins of the world because by, by keeping them in the theology sort of school system, you know, te not teaching yeah. about science and so, yeah. big bang. I, I think it's complicated. And I think that it goes back to some Supreme Court decisions a little bit earlier in the 1960s that that came during the same period when schools were desegregating. So in 1962 and 1963, the Supreme Court struck down mandatory prayer and Bible reading in public schools. Oh, so yeah. I said, you know, you cannot, it violates the establishment clause of the First Amendment to, you know, require kids to pray or read the Bible, you know, by officially by the teacher in public schools. And this really fed this conspiracy theory among um, fundamentalists and evangelicals that public schools were anti-Christian or communist or secretly teaching your kids about communism or Islam. I mean, like there's, I mean, there's always kind of a new permutation of this conspiracy theory that that public schools or like some in the religious right like to call them government schools are trying to indoctrinate your children with anti-Christian ideas, whether that's, you know, getting rid of, um, you know, enforcing the separation of church and state by getting rid of mandatory school Bible uh, reading or, or prayer. 
um, or uh, in their view, you know, it's anti-Christian to teach about certain topics. Um, and this has spilled over not only into um, uh, issues of school prayer, but just the whole idea of what America is that, that, that quote unquote government schools don't teach that America is a Christian nation. They teach the myth of the separation of church and state. There's a lot of sort of complicated mm -hmm. uh, culture war touchstones here um, that all play a role in all of this. Um, but, you know, one of the things I, I talk about in the book is how school curricula in this same time period in the 1970s also became um, a touch point for the religious right where they claimed that curriculum changes that were intended to uh, teach kids about you know diversity and racial equality were actually anti-christian and needed to be taken off the the school curriculum so um, public schools have for a long time been sort of the hot zone for a lot of these culture war issues. That's amazing, man. And now I, I see it more from what you're talking about, what's in the book. I see it more when I see like, you know, I think Donald Trump or Donald Trump Jr. put out the other day, they're, they're going to stop Christmas. I didn't hear anybody say Christmas. Now I hear it every day. And you're like, right. you hear it in March. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you hanging out with? Yeah, but, uh, right. I mean, like the war on Christmas is maybe one of you know, <laughs> the more ridiculous um, uh, culture war battles that uh, that they fight, but it's all it's all sort of related to the same idea that this more diverse, pluralistic, you know, whether racially or religiously, more pluralistic nation is a threat to what they perceive as the Christian nation, and Donald Trump is saving that Christian nation for them. I mean, I think that Eric Trump was on the campaign trail for him last week and even said that his father had literally saved Christianity, which yeah. is obviously the most ridiculous thing to say. Um, but uh, Do yeah, they believe so that? They, yeah, they really they believe it. that he is this um, messianic figure who has come and he's unafraid to combat the fake news and the political correctness and all of these things that are keeping them down. And uh, so it's because he's impolitic and it's because he's anti-democratic, small d democratic, that they see him as this um, heroic figure. It's crazy. And, and I mean, do they kind of see him as a, as an angel of destruction, like an Old Testament sort of thing? Yeah, so um, you hear, I've interviewed people who, you know, so this is something that um, Lance Wallnow, who's an evangelist who is, uh, has been a Trump backer from, you know, back dating back to the uh, primaries, or Rodney Howard Brown, who's a televangelist in Florida, they'll use the term wrecking ball. He's a wrecking ball. Wow. Um, because that's what needs to happen to kind of rebuild everything because the liberals have so destroyed America um, that we need to have this wrecking ball come in and just mow it all down and start over. So when they're saying the cities are burning and all that kind of crap, because, you know, I, I hear that from people. They're like, the cities are burning. And you're like, no, they're not. I uh, just checked on Instagram on some cities right. and it's going really well. But th they're probably more so referring to the, you know, the satanic, uh, I don't know, teaching science and Big Bang Theory and stuff like that, I guess, more so than anything. Well, I do think that there's a history there of looking at um civil rights protests by black people as being violent and dangerous. Oh, um, and it's also so, a racial yeah, so there, trope. There's definitely a, a, a <laughs> racial trope going on there. Um, but also that cities um, are, you know, more liberal and therefore, uh, you know, like all of this is sort of in the, in the mix here, um, that cities are more liberal and therefore more prone to uh -huh. that kind of chaos and uncertainty and violence that only um, conservatism and uh, law and order, as Trump likes to say, uh, can restore. So it's and, very and much a the... sort of like city versus not city kind of um, ideology, along with this uh, idea that uh, civil rights protests are 
you know, against law and order, that they're ne- in, inherently violent. And I would imagine homosexuality is mixed all in there. Like the other day, I someone pointed out to me that part of the Pelosi trope of of hitting on her hitting her is uh you know san francisco liberal which is a is a wink and a nod to that trope of you know the that never occurred to me i just thought she were bashing liberals being jerks and i was like oh wow okay you know um so it's interesting do you do you see the is there anything that's going to break the back of this whole relationship with trump and and christians where they wake up and they go yeah this this is a bad road we got on or does he have to either pass away from many heart attack strokes or be imprisoned or um i don't know maybe he'll be a martyr at that point i mean i think that you see you know like you'll see the occasional um person who says i voted for him in 2016 but now i can't put up with him anymore he's a liar and and you know he's he's a misogynist and he's terrible Um, But when you look at the polling data, I mean, white evangelicals, I mean, apart from just Republicans in general, white evangelicals are his most loyal followers. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when you have them believing that God anointed him or God's hand is on him and God put him in, in office for this particular time, and then you see the enthusiasm with which they're treating his ramming through of Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court you see it comes into view how much they are an anti-democratic small d movement that their minority view, right? Cause like their opposition to abortion and same-sex marriage and for uh, religious exemptions for people who oppose same-sex marriage, th- this is a minority view among Americans, right? This is not shared by the majority of Americans but they're willing to use these anti-democratic small d means to install a Supreme Court justice um, so that they can have it be the law of the land regardless. Um, And so they see Trump because he's not worried about the political fallout of him doing this. Like another Republican president might be like, hmm, maybe this isn't the best move right before the election because it might lose me some votes. For them, it's, it's, it's more like he doesn't care. He cares so much about us he doesn't even care about the political fallout. And we know that he's on the right side because God's hand is on him. They're definitely in that feedback loop. And that's how, I mean, yesterday he, he, he did this fascist thing where he yelled at uh, one of the reporters right. you know, calling him and a saying, criminal. you know, you need to be a criminal. You're in jail. And, and just, I, I just sat there and went, man, it, in some old world of America, that guy would be off the boat right then. But uh uh, what do I know? Uh, so let me ask you this, because they're talking more about how white women are the ones, the suburban women are the ones that are really starting to vote and move against him now. They right. kind of sub- bought into him in 2016, mm-hmm. and now they're kind of moving away from him. And the one thing that's still strong is college, non-college males, mm-hmm. white males, who go for him. And, and I kind of had an understanding of that, that male sort of thinking. I come from the sixties and, and early seventies where, you know, there was a lot more of that toxic masculinity and more and more I've, I'm looking at as toxic masculinity, what's yeah. going on with these guys. Cause I know what they want. They want, they want to be able to beat their chest. They want to be able to walk around and grab everybody and be the sexist pigs they want to be. And, and, and uh, you know, all things male. Uh, well, not, I, I don't want to say all things male cause we're changing that sort of uh, to come hopefully but you know they want to go back to the 60s and the 70s where i don't know it was it was mad men i suppose might be a good mm-hmm. reference mm-hmm. and uh and and like you say they 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 get excited by him being able to do that in his in his prosperity and they they think well i could do that someday too I, that's the world i want to have which is probably a dying well it is a dying thing that isn't going to last um so do you do you do you see maybe some of the uh, white women, uh, suburbanites changing, or are they gonna? I mean, because I've actually heard, and I'm sorry I didn't let you finish on that one, but I've actually heard that some of the white women now are are secretly talking like to CNN, and they're like, I'm not gonna tell my husband how I'm gonna vote, but it's not gonna be for Trump. I don't know what do you think. <laughs> well, I think that 
I think a sure sign that Trump's internal polling says that he's doing badly with women is his campaign stop. I think it was last week <laughs> where he talked about how much the women love him. Right. So like every time he says something like that, you know, it's born of a like a panic attack because their polling shows that um, he's doing poorly with women. I think all the public polling shows this enormous gender gap, like amazingly, you know, a bigger gender gap than there was when we had a female presidential candidate in 2016 in Hillary Clinton. Um, so yes, I think that Trump is very much damaging himself with his just horrible misogyny, his, mm -hmm. as you say, his toxic masculinity. He's damaging himself with women. Um, I would be very curious, and I think that the, the polling doesn't get down to this granular level of detail, but I would be very curious um, about white evangelical women in particular, and if they've, to what extent they've given up on him, because toxic masculinity is also a very serious problem in evangelical culture. Yeah. And, um, and if you feel like you've been the victim of, of toxic masculinity or some kind of spiritual abuse as a woman, um, and I wonder if you look at Trump and say, yep, that seems kind of familiar and not in a good way. Um, so, but I don't, think, I don't think I've seen a poll that breaks down um, the gender gap within religious um, uh, groups, which would obviously be extremely interesting. Attention <laughs> pollsters, do it. <laughs> it uh, you and I are going to be reading the the the, uh, the the results afterwards, going, "What the hell happened?" Of course, now it, it might take a couple weeks from what I'm reading. Um, what are some other aspects of the book that can encourage them to go out and buy it uh, that maybe we've missed? Well, I think that if you wonder how we got here, how Trump is still president, how he survived the impeachment, and why why his dalliance, dalliances with Russia and with Putin leave his base cheering on for more. Um, this book has all of these things, right? So I talk about um, 2016. I talk about the early um, years of his presidency. I go into the history of the racism um, in the religious right and how the precursors to the alt-right uh, back in the, in the 70s and 80s were enmeshed um, in this growing movement. And then I look at how his, um, how his, his administration is carrying out the, this theocratic agenda um, uh, through policy and personnel and why, um, why this is part of a, how this is part of a global movement um, towards greater authoritarianism and especially greater authoritarianism with sort of a Christian veneer on it. Wow. We're really screwed if these guys take prayer. I think I saw you talking about um, one of the reasons that the Christians are okay, the white evangelicals are okay with the Putin connection. Do you want to talk about that a little bit maybe? Yeah. So these were some of the most anti-communist people, right, during the Cold War, right? They viewed communism as an anti-Christian threat to America, but, but specifically an anti-Christian threat to America. And then after the fall of communism, when you saw the rise of autocrats like Putin, but particularly his um, invocation of Russia's Christian past, um, obviously Orthodox Christianity as opposed to evangelicalism, but still, and his willingness to wage similar culture wars in Russia as they were waging here. So efforts to criminalize homosexuality, for example, mm -hmm. in Russia. Um, these were things that they admired Putin for as opposed to raised questions about Putin. Uh, and so there are American figures in the religious right who are um, very much working with and connected to autocrats like Putin or Viktor Orban in Hungary or um, Bolsonaro in Brazil because of how they overlay their authoritarianism with Christianity and with opposition to LGBTQ rights and wow. uh, abortion. 
That's just scary. I and mean, we saw Hungary uh, fall. Its democracy is pretty much dead at this point, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, democracies can die. And I think that's the biggest thing that people don't realize right now um, is that is that that's how it dry, dies. I mean, we're all running around drunk going, yeah, there's nothing that can stop America and the democracy and stuff. And then one day it's over and you're like, yeah. what happened? And, you know, we've seen that in the past and everything else. So uh, it's a great book. Everyone should check it out. Um, you're going to learn a lot. You're going to understand, you know, like you say, it's not a black and white sort of thing. And, and I'm not talking about race here. I'm, it's not a monolith of like, why do white evangelicals like Trump? It's very complicated, in depth, and and I think until all of us start really understanding what's going on and what it, it's all about, um, because I remember my initial arguments with people after the election were like, "No, the people just wanted jobs," and you're like, "No, man, this goes way <laughs> deeper than that." Right, right, exactly. There you go. Well, it's been wonderful to have Sarah on the show. Uh, the book is called Unholy White. I'm sorry, unholy, why white evangelicals worship at the altar of Donald Trump. And boy, I'd like to see what's going to finally make that stop. Uh, thanks for being on the show with us, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Uh, guys, uh, where can they check you out on the interwebs too as well, Sarah? Uh, uh, typeinvestigations.org, sarahposner.com, or on Twitter, at Sarah Posner. There you go. Check her out, guys. And uh, for my audience, uh, be sure to check out the video version of this on YouTube.com forward slash Chris Voss. Hit that bell notification. You can also go to Amazon.com forward slash shop forward slash Chris Voss. You can see all the books that uh, of all the wonderful authors who've been on the show. And uh, also refer the show to your friends, neighbors, relatives. Go to the CVPN or Chris Voss Podcast Network. Thanks to my audience for tuning in. We'll see you guys next time. <laughs>